Hello, welcome to Board Games with Niramas. I'm Joseph and it's time today to talk a bit about the games I've been playing during January. So the first of ever sort of impressions vlog or first impressions vlog as I call it. And it's going to be really fun. It's going to be fun to just talk a lot about the games that I've been playing, uh, the good and the bad <laughs> back and forth. Now I have organized these in uh, alphabetical order. So as you can see up here, uh, they all show up there and we'll talk through them one by one. And yeah, as you can see there also, there is a timestamp so you can jump straight to the one that you are interested in or if there's, you know, several of them or you can just watch the whole video, of course. Because I am going to, I'm not going to stress it, I'm going to talk fairly through all the, you know, the pros and cons of each game. So this might be a little longer video since there's 13 games that I played during January that I will be talking about. Next month it might be five or something. So I'm not going to limit myself in the amount of time it takes. So let's get going with the first one and let's talk about Bruges. So let's talk a bit about Bruges or Bruges or I, I don't really know how to pronounce this. Bruges. Anyway, <laughs> it's a game from 2013. So this is one of the old ones on this list. Most of the games on this list are newer games that were just released and so on. But this is an older one. This is one I've been wanting to play for quite a while. I've been looking for a chance to play it. It's from, you know, it's designed by Stefan Feld, which is one of my favorite designers. I heard so much good about this game as well. I know that C. Garcia over at the Dice Tower, he talked about this being his favorite Feld game. Uh, for me, it's been Castle Burgundy, it's been my Feld, you know, go-to game, but I was excited to try this one out now that I got the chance. And it was a really fun game night. Really, uh, you know, had a good, you know, good game, good game group playing together. And we played this one with the, uh, both the expansions. So um, I, have, I haven't played the base game uh, alone, but the expansions, let's check out what was the, the City on the Swing and uh, Brugge die Haustiere, which is like uh, pets, basically, or like animals. So you have add animals in there as well. Um, I must say, first of all, I really enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed the gameplay. Um, what you do on the, in the game is you have these dice that, you know, every round, sort of you roll these dice and they are a common pool in the middle of the table. Let's see if I can find some good pictures here. I haven't prepared pictures. But basically, when you use, then when you play cards or you do effects, th those, the, the pip value of the die of a certain color corresponds to the card that you play of a certain color. And that uh, determines how good the card is, basically, at that round. How much money you get if you spend a card for that. But it's really nice how you sort of, you spend <clears throat> the, all the cards, have, they have different colors, but all the cards also can do different things. Like you can get these, you know, have these worker meeples and all that. And let's see, here's some cards. So you can spend a card or play a card in order to get two workers of that color, of the same color as the card. You can spend the card in order to get as much money as the die pip value of that color die is that turn or that round. Uh, you can spend it to get rid of one of these disaster tokens. It's, I, I really like this when it was like a period, I think, where Stefan Feld did these games that were like you're building up something, but at the same time, disasters or bad things are going to happen, but you can prepare for them. It's like, I really like that in games. Uh, when you have like a, a negative sort of event deck coming, but you can see it up ahead and you can prepare for it. So you can spend a card, like in this case, a brown card to get rid of one of those, a plague or a rat uh, little uh, tr triangle. And so if you ever get three of those tiles, then this disaster will happen to you and you will lose uh, uh, peop some people or buildings or you know money or whatever. You can also use the card to build on the canal, which I will show you soon here, or you can use it to build a house. Um, so you have these different, so like here's the canals, you put out these pieces on the canal to extend from wherever you start and then you you know you can build up here and that will get you points and all that and it's like a race whoever has the longest canal so it's, and that's also fun in this game so there's a few of those different races going on who has the most of this and that and whoever and it's, it's interesting because you don't need to have them you know you don't need to lead the race at the end of the game it's like if you at some point during the game have the longest canal then you get to flip your canal token and you're going to score that at the end of the game but then someone might surpass you in the longest canal, but that doesn't matter because at one point during the game you were in the lead, which is a nice system. I really like it. And I, these cards, they are so much fun. You, you build, build them out like a tableau in front of you, 
And then some of them uh, have like a little worker place there that you can use. And then you can send, in this case, like this one here, you can send a yellow worker out there to do the action down here uh, once per, per, per round. So it's, all, it's like a, you build your own worker placement spots also. Uh, or, or you get some, you know, one-time effect from the cards, or you have an ongoing effect that's, you know, and you can flip the cards upside down and build a house, which you need to do. All these characters, all uh, the cards characters, can need to be in a house. So it's like multi-use cards. You can use them for, for one of the what is it, five effects on the actual card. One of them being being uh, flipping it over, making a house. Uh, or you can play it as the actual character and get whatever benefit that's on the card. So so much fun card play in this and I really enjoy this in games. Uh, I mean recently, I, you know, uh, sort of recently we had the Empires of the North, the Imperial Settlers game that has similar, of course this came out before that, but it has this similar tableau building with different effects on cards that I really enjoy. So. Bruges, absolutely great game. I, I look forward to playing it again. I, I know this is out of print, it's hard to get. Um, I hope they will do some kind of uh, like anniversary anniversary edition, maybe in three years, <laughs> 10 years uh, anniversary. Uh, they did that with the in the Year of the Dragon and Notre Dame. So it's not the same, I don't think it's the same. This is um, Hans and Gluck, Seaman, I don't know. I don't think it's the same publisher. But anyway, I, I just hope that they release Bruges as you know updated version um, I think it looks okay as it is. I mean, they could, you know, work a little bit on the artwork, of course. Uh, but anyway, the gameplay really fun, so I recommend it. So now let's head over to the next one, which is Bunny Kingdom. Okay, so let's talk a bit about Bunny Kingdom. Bunny Kingdom is a game that came out a few years ago. It's getting good, uh, you know, response. Seven point four here on BGG, and of course. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing all these board game geeks here, of course. Uh, if I don't have a video for the game, it's coming later. I have some videos for some of these games I'll talk to talk about today. But Bunny Kingdom uh, got some really good hype. I know some reviewers really talked well about it. And, you know, I had it for over a year in my shelf uh, because I got it to review and I never got around to it. And, you know, there's been so many games and yeah. So it's been on my shelf and finally I decided to, now it's time, you know, I have to play this game. So, it, because you can't really play it on two, that's why me and Martin haven't played it. Martin played it um, with other people uh, on higher play account and he liked it as well. So I had a lot of good, you know, good feelings about this game going into it. And I finally sat down um, last week, played it with three other people. So we were four players. And first of all, the rule book was really bad. It was really tricky to find uh, clear sort of clear you know sentences about okay how does this work and it was really it was some examples in the rule book but it was really you know I, I didn't like it at all it was really really weird to get my head around even though it's a fairly simple game it is a really simple game but all what, what all the different cards do and how you can use uh like the camp card took a while before we figure that out but anyway we played a, a full game and we did it correctly as far as i can tell and i didn't like it at all um this was you know, the biggest disappointment for me in a while. Uh, it happens in, in gaming that you think a game is something that you will enjoy and you're excited about it and all that, and then it turns out to be something else than you thought. And I mean, I even heard some reviewers, I don't remember who, but saying that, oh, this, you know, this is better than Seven Wonders. And that's just ridiculous in my opinion. Now, I only played it once. This is a first impression vlog, of course. Uh, but my first impression was a really negative one. Even though, I mean, I had, it had a good game group. Everybody got into it. Uh, some of the other people at the table enjoyed it more than I did. But first of all, I don't like this chess board thingy. Now I have the second edition, so it has the bigger board. So that wasn't an issue with the space. Um, you know, it still got crowded in some ways. But, but first of all, I, I don't like the, you know, playing a card and I have to look for like, okay, so it's D8 and I have to find, okay, so that's the spot I'll place the bunny in. Why is it bunnies, by the way? I, don't, I didn't get the buckle bunny thing at all. I think that was just, I think they would have been better with some other theme. I think that was weird. Um, and it was so abstracted in, in, in that way because of that chessboard uh, sort of. And also the way it scores, I really didn't like the way it scores because first of all, it doesn't matter how big your kingdom is. It doesn't matter how many bunnies you put out, how many, how big your area that you have taken over is. Uh, like with some exceptions, there's some end goal cards, some parchment cards you can play that says, okay, if you have this and that many areas, or if you have the most areas, then you score some points. So, but overall it didn't matter. So, and that was just a, so 
weird feeling. I mean, I played King Domino and I played other games where you want to make a big area. That's sort of the normal way to score these kind of games. And in this one, it doesn't. It didn't matter. What mattered was the the amount, the number of different um, you know, towers on your castles, which was kind of cool, nice pieces, and then multiplied with the number of re unique resources that your that area um, had access to. And that was so weird. That was so weird. And and the worst thing was that on the on the map itself. There's like only three. There's only I think it's wood, fish, and and um, carrots. That's the only three resources. So that's three times whatever is the is the max multiplier. Unless you find these cards with these luxury resources that you can add to your area, and I never saw those in all those rounds, all that drafting. Uh, I never got the chance to pick one of those cards because people realized, oh, they are really good, so they're gonna get them at you know at the first chance to get them. And it's kind of weird, I think, uh, to put such a I mean, I don't mind if there's like a few unique cards. Again, compared to Seven Wonders, yeah, it's good if you get those green cards, the science cards, but there's a bunch of those science cards. In this one, you, the only way you can score and get a higher multiplier than three is if you find one of those luxury resource cards, and those are fairly few. So I don't think it's too, I mean, I only played once, but I can imagine that it's not that rare that one out of four players will never see one of those, or maybe see only one, and they're so 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 important for your scoring. So I think that was really weird. Uh, I think it was a weird design. Uh, it didn't feel like uh, there was like no theme in it. It was just abstracted, and these bunnies just didn't make sense at all. And I didn't have fun playing it. Um, I think the whole system. I think what really makes Seven Wonders so good is that you have these you know defined eras. You draft the cards, you play them one by one. Here you drafted, you took two cards every every time, and then you sort of prepare them. So you either put out the bunny or you had it ready for an, an extra phase later on where you get to place your castles or upgrade them and so on. And I didn't enjoy it. I, I don't think it was that great. And, and also another really strong card was these like, I don't know what the word, spirit bridges or something or whatever, like bridges that you could connect two of your areas on the map. And that's really powerful, of course, because then you can make a big area, especially if you have those luxury resources in there. And there were two of those in the whole game. So, I mean, uh, those two that got one each, they got a lot of points at the end. So, yeah, just weird. I didn't like it at all. So, I can't recommend Bunny Kingdom at all. I, will, I won't play it again. I don't think so. Uh, you know, these days there's so many games. If a game is going to get a second try, then I have to have a, a decent first impression. This was just a neg negative for me. So, tell me in the comment section if you agree or disagree, but that was Bunny Kingdom, let's move on to the next one. So, next up we have Cairn, or Karn, Cairn, uh, which is a game that I made a video of together with Martin, so I'll put up the video here instead, it's more fun to watch than just the boarding geek page, right? Anyway, this one is a two-player sort of uh, abstract strategy game basically or hex movement which is not something i enjoy that much i just talked about it in bunny kingdom i'm not a big fan of chess and all that this is like thematic chess in some ways it's not that thematic but sort of uh it, it, it has an interesting action selection mechanism where you choose one of three actions and when you do that like if you move straight if i move straight ahead or like orthogonally then that tile flips over and now uh, my opponent can only move diagonally and if he or she chooses to do that then it goes back to me being able to move orthogonally again. and the goal of the game is to get one of your little shamans really good pieces though the, the production quality of this game is awesome really good amazing production quality and you're trying to get one of them or several of them over to the other player's side because then you get to score a point by putting out one of these little monolith uh, tiles and though ha those have special abilities so that will really change up the game every time you play which is also fun uh, i think that's like what made the game fun it's like seeing those oh that one came out then i can do this and this combo uh, there's ways to stop your opponent from getting over to your side and all that and we had fun with this i mean we played it a few times and we filmed it and we had fun all the time with it and i, I felt like i got into it and i started enjoying it and it stays in my collection I, you know i uh, just sold a bunch of games yeah, so uh, this was one that I didn't put out for sale because I do enjoy it. And I, I plan to play this more up ahead with, you know, different friends. I like having these kind of two-player games that are well-made and, and solid. And, you know, I, I, I kind of enjoyed the... I think for me, I am, a, you know, if you've been watching my channel, you know that I, 
I have a weak spot for good components and nice minis and all that and they really lifted the game to some extent. Uh, the only thing I think I sort of felt was lacking in this one was asymmetrical powers. Uh, now both sides had the same um, things going for them. It would be nice if, if you had these, if you could have like, you know, maybe you could have a deck of cards, you draw uh, two and you select one at the start of the game and that's the one uh, that you will have and maybe this guy can move, I don't know, two spaces every time he moves diagonally or whatever. You can have some special power for your uh, side and, and these could also be themed a bit different depending on if you're the forest people or the, the I don't know, water people or whatever they're called. These really cool little dwarfs with their hats and all that. I do like that. So yeah, that, that's maybe one thing that I felt was a bit weird that it wasn't in the game. It sort of felt like it should have been in the game. It's, it's like these days, if you make this kind of game, it felt like some kind of asymmetrical um, differences would be cool. But I liked it. And so yeah, can recommend it. Two play game uh, back and forth and sort of this race, whoever gets to three points first by doing these actions. And you, by the way, you can also get a point by trapping one of your uh, opponents by you know getting them into the right position and sort of execute a, a spell or whatever it's called. So I do like it, Cairn. And I mentioned it earlier uh, when I talked about Bruges. Uh, Stefan Feld's uh, Castles of Burgundy, my favorite Stefan Feld game. Uh, still, is my favorite Stefan Feld game. Uh, I really enjoyed it a lot. And now they came out with an, a sort of I don't know what to call it. It's not a. It, they, they don't call it a deluxe version, and they don't call it an anniversary deluxe edition either. But it, it's called like Castle Burgundy with expansions because all the expansions are included here, which was really cool. I don't have all those expansions for my uh, norm, my old game. But yeah, I don't know if I'm going to talk that much about Castle Burgundy. I really enjoyed it a lot. I mean, you can go check out this video if you want to see how it plays. I played solo here, and, and that's also cool. Uh, the solo expansion was in here. It's not in the base game. And I, I liked it at solo. Uh, really cool. I liked that it's, it was not about scoring points. It was like filling your whole board. That was the goal. Really, really cool. So there's a lot of good things to say about this game. I love the game in itself, the gameplay and all that, but let's talk a little bit about this edition because that's what new, what, what is new. The game itself is, is fairly old. So the it's like they made a new art on the board and on the car, like on the tiles. Um, and I, if we just look at the art here, if we just talk about the art and the sort of how the game functions and works with that art, how the iconography works, I'd rather play the old one, which is kind of weird. Uh, maybe it's, it has to do with me being used to the old iconography. Uh, I know all the tiles and all that, and I now I had to look them up all the time, and it was like, what is this? Is this the bank, or what is this? I didn't like that, and I don't think this is as easy to learn, to get into, and get used to those symbols, because they kind of removed, like, used to be, I don't know, it used to be that you sort of could look at a tile and sort of figure out somewhat what it was going to do. Uh, I don't know, and it, it's like these some weird thematic changes, like the when you place a boat, you move up in turn order, but the turn order track, now this is solo, so there was no turn order, but you move up on a bridge. It used to be that you moved up on a little river, which made more sense because you placed a boat, you, you invested in a boat, and therefore you got ahead of the other players and you became the first player or whatever. So it's just weird as you change that into a bridge. Uh, I don't know. Uh, some small things like that that annoyed me and I didn't really like. So weirdly enough, if you have the option of buying this one or the old version, well, of course, this one comes with the expansions. That's the thing. That's the thing. Uh, if you just want to try the game out, buy the old version. You can probably find it. You know, I don't. You know, maybe like a, a second-hand market and all that. But of course, if you don't have, if you can't find it, I mean, buy this new one. It's good as well. It's just weird for me play the old one and then go to this one and then some weird stuff, uh, changed, weird changes that didn't really improve the game. And it was kind of sad. I mean, they had a chance now to make the game look a lot better, to make it modern and updated. I mean, to me, this looks like a uh, 90s computer game with all these like pixel graphics. Uh, it, it doesn't look good. Uh, it just looks uh, plottery. I, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense that they release a whole new version and it looks like this. And I wonder if they are happy with it themselves. I don't know. A uh, funny story here is that I met Stefan Feld, the designer at Essen Spiel, at a Elea uh, sort of event, and 
um, he was look, standing there looking at the game set up on a table and um, I told him that I was excited about uh, a new version for it. And, and he said that it was the first time he himself saw the new version. Of course, I mean, he has an, I guess, the as a designer, I mean, I guess it's the, the publisher that made the new version. And I don't know if he's happy about it. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't look good in my opinion. And I think, I mean, art is subjective, but just from a, a view of how easy it is the game to teach, how easy it is to get into the game, how, how functional is the art, in that regard, this is worse sort of than the first one, in my opinion. Then you might like this look more, I don't know. But anyway, not impressed with that, but I really like the gameplay and I love that all the expansions are in there, so there's a lot of content. You can even play a team game, two versus two. Haven't tried that yet, but I look forward to trying that because Castles of Burgundy is an awesome game. And then let's talk about Catan. Speaking of reprints, this is Catan Star Starfarers. Or Starfarers of Catan, as it was called from uh, initially. I think it came out in 1999. And back then, the the Catan game was called Settlers of Catan. So, of course, that was Starfarers of Catan. And now they changed the name to just Catan, which meant this became Catan Starfarers instead, I guess. Really cool uh, reprint. Now, I, I never played the first one. It's been out of print for, for years. And I just heard about people saying that it was so much better than Catan, the original game. Now, there's nothing wrong with Catan. In my opinion, I think it's a good gateway game for the hobby. Uh, it's, it's brought a lot of people into the hobby uh, in some parts myself uh, as well. I played Catan, you know, probably 20 years ago. Um, we used to play Catan. I had a group of friends and we were partying a lot. <laughs> and drinking a lot of uh, alcohol and going to pubs and all that. And at the beginning of the evenings, we often played Catan. Uh, before all the, all the guests showed up, we played a game of Catan and we you know, had some beers. Um, now these days I don't really drink uh, beers. But anyway, back then it was, it was a really fun tradition we had, you know, Friday evenings and all that. So yeah, I myself, I come from, from the background of playing a lot of Catan before I started really playing board games. So, so what is Catan's... Starfarers then? Well, it is a in space, of course, but it's not just the same game. You have the same base where every time it's your turn, you roll two dice, whatever number comes up, it's going to produce on different planets, it's going to produce different uh, resources. You can trade these resources with each other or with the uh, bank or the supply, and then you use these resources in order to build. But So you build settlements in some ways. You build kind of really cool little rockets that sort of fly around with your settlement. And when you decide to drop it down on a planet, then you just remove the, the rocket on top of it. <laughs> so you sort of leave it there. But you also have this new thing, which is trade ships. So it works the same. You just fly around with your rocket and then you drop off your trade station uh, at sort of a planet that is already inhabited. So it doesn't produce any resources, but you get in contact with some alien races and they will give you a special effect, a special bonus that you have for the rest of the game, which is cool. Like maybe you can trade uh, a resource for two to one instead of three to one. Or maybe every time you get, um, what's it called, like ore, uh, you get two instead of getting one. So they change that up. You don't have these like small cities and the big cities or the little towns and cities and the towns produce two instead. That's gone. Instead, you can get it this way. What's really cool is also, as I'm showing you here, the this is my unboxing, by the way. I haven't made a playthrough of this yet. It's coming, but it's not done yet. Uh, so here we have, we put in these little uh, colored pieces uh, into your mothership, as it's called. And then you shake it up and you look at the bottom and that's going to show two of those marbles or, or plastic um, balls. And depending on that, those colors, you get a number of spaces you can move or you get some kind of effect. Because, because another really, really cool thing about this game is like, like I said, you roll the die, you get resources, uh, you can trade and you can build. Uh, one thing you can also build is pieces onto your mothership. So you actually put plastic pieces on to get more engine going or, or, or guns and so on. Really cool. And then the, the new thing that you do is you, you sort of roll your mothership, you shake it and see what colors are there. And that determines how much um, spaces you can move with your little ships out there on the board in order to get to new planets and, and do trades and colonization and all of that. And if you do, when you do that, if you get one of those, there's one black uh, ball in there. If you get that one showing, then the player to your left is going to read you a little story card. And that story card is so cool. I wasn't prepared for this when me and Martin tried this out. Uh, I didn't know that that was in the game. That was really cool that you had this 
well, not story, but like a little um, choose your uh, outcome thingy. So the story card could say something like, uh, you encounter a pirate in space. Do you want to try to chase after him and hunt him, you know, shoot him down? And you can choose yes or no. You can go for no if you feel like you don't have that many cannons, uh, you're not that strong. So maybe you don't want to risk it because it could be, you know, a, a negative effect if you fail. And if, if you choose yes, then you will do some kind of, kind of test. And those tests are a bit different. It could be that you shake your mothership to see how strong you, you are. Uh, and you might compare that together with your cannons against another player that, you know, is, is playing as the pirate in that case. So uh, really fun stuff. Really enjoyed it a lot. And I, I look forward to playing this on four players. I think that's how the game will shine the most because we'll, it will be crowded in space. And yeah, it's not even, it's, it's from three to, to four players. Um, basically, so me and Martin just, you know, faked it in order to be able to try it, but it's not for two players normally. But I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a really positive surprise for me, Catan Starfarers. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I, I think this, I mean, this might make it into some top list for me. I mean, that's, that's a real surprise for me. Uh, I wasn't expecting that at all. <laughs> I was expecting Catan you know, family style game, which is still is a family style game, but it was more game to it than I expected. So really enjoyed it, Catan Starfarers. So next up we have Deal of Merchants Collection, which, uh, wow, it's got a high score at 8.0. And this was released at Essence Spiel, and I contacted the publisher uh, or the designer, Sami Laxo, and he, you know, he wanted to uh, give me a review copy. So I am going to make a video of this as well coming up. But it's kind of weird. I mean, I like Dale of Merchants. I played the Dale of Merchants 2 before this, and I really enjoy that. It's a deck builder. And it has these like, um, I don't know the English word, but it's like animals being as humans or whatever. It's like animals being the different houses here, basically being representing different suits in the game. And they all have different themes. So maybe the, the penguins, they want to do some kind of thing and some other, you know, the turtles, they're good at a certain thing like card draw or whatever. And uh, Dale of Merchants 2, I thought was really fun. It was um, maybe on the longer side, but it's one of those deck builders that has an interesting twist because you're not just building a deck. You're, it, it's, it has some similarities in feel to Dominion because at some point, someone will start to go for points. And then when that race is triggered, then everybody has to tag along sort of just like buying the, the provinces in uh, Dominion. Because in Dale of Merchants, you're building up your deck, but then you're deconstructing your deck by taking cards out of it to form merchant stalls and they go from value from one to eight so the first one you put out the in one strength card but then for the second one you can put out a two strength or two ones together to form that stack and so on and then it keeps going up to eight so there's a race whoever does that first will be the winner and the as i said these different uh, houses or like these different uh, animals have different themes and different styles and in this uh, collection game they also have uh, characters like everybody has an asymmetrical character which is really cool I really like that um, and yeah I played it a bit and I really enjoyed it uh, I must say now the only thing I think is a bit weird is that to me if you buy a game because they sold this as essence bill right if you buy a game called collection I would sort of expect to get a collection of that game all the cards and all that but in this case you get something that is not in the other games and then you need to have Dale of Merchants 1 and 2 and upcoming 3 as well. And the box can hold all those cards and then you have the collection. When you have all those games in that box, in the collection box. So by just having the collection like I have now, because I don't own um, any of the other ones, it's a bit weird because I, I don't have access. Like the rule book has all the different uh, house, all the different animal families in it. And like recommended uh, setups and combos. But I don't have like... 75% of those cards because I only have the collection card that came with the collection box and they are all very in some ways complex uh, versions uh, of the, the themes. They are like the most uh, highest complexity of them all I think so I think this would be much more fun if I had the <laughs> Merchants 1 and 2 because then I could mix you know one animal family from 1 and 2 from 2 and 3 from the collection or something like that and we could play with those uh, that I think that would be better balancing uh, these cards felt like almost too powerful when we played it um, you could 
it, it was too fast in some ways. I don't know. So I just think that was a bit weird that they sell, sell this as a collection. Um, and the rule book says like, oh, here's all the cards, but you don't you don't have all these cards in this box. There's only a few of them. <laughs> so I think that was a bit weird. But otherwise, I liked it, and I am going to make a uh, run through together with Draco so you can see how the game plays because I do like the the base uh, how the game flows in Dale of Merchants. It's, it, I really enjoy that, and uh, I think maybe it's a bit too much take that for my taste in some ways because the, the, some of these family animal families is all about messing with your opponents. So. But yeah, Dale of Merchants collection, pretty cool. Then next up we have Frankenstein, which is a uh, small box game that me and Martin did a playthrough of together. And it's not really made for two players, I think. It's, you can play it at two players, but it's, it's an auction game in some sense. So it makes more sense to have more players because that would be more, make for more interesting auctions. On two, it's just like, yeah, I bid this and do you want to bid over me or not? <laughs> which is kind of weird. So, but it's not just about auctions. You can also buy the cards straight out. And what you do basically is you're trying to build your own Frankenstein's monster. So as you can see here, um, no, behind me here, we have our board with the different body parts. So you're collecting body parts from a graveyard, basically, which is kind of weird. And then you put them together. So you need to have a torso and a head and all that. And whoever makes their uh, monster first can say it's alive and they win the game. Which I like. I like the theme of this. I like the whole. It's so. It's such a rare theme. It's such a, you know disgusting theme in some ways, but it's fun. And I, I like how the game mechanism works. You have your player shield, so the, the other players don't know how much money you have and all that. And you're trying to you know outbid the other ones to get the body parts that you need. And sometimes angry villagers show up, and you need to pay them off basically. And yeah, I think the production is really good. I think it's just nice, the artwork and the theme and the feeling of the game. And uh, there's the Angry Villagers. And I think the game uh, would do a lot better on more players. Now, I've only played it with Martin, so I, you know, I can't speak for it on four players, or I think you can even be five. But I really want to try it at higher player count, because I think that will make the game more justice. Now, we had fun playing this on two players as well, so... Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure if, if I would recommend it if you're only going to play on two players uh, because I think that would get, it's fun like once or twice, but I think it would get, you know, a bit samey. Uh, but if you play on more players, it's going to be more interesting auctions and all that. And yeah, r really cool little game for what it does and uh, what's in that box. You, you get a lot of games. So I uh, recommend you to go check out this video if you haven't, uh, Frankenstein Playthrough, because, you know, it, it has some really fun stuff in it. So now let's head on to the next one. Okay, so next up here we have In the Hall of the Mountain King, which um, is a, some, a really, really cool game. It has, it has some really interesting things in it, at least. Um, I don't think it's going to be one that I will be playing a lot, but I will explain why <laughs> as I go here. Because basically the game is you are trolls trying to get into this mountain, you're digging tunnels in order to get these statues that will bring you glory or aka victory points. And you get these kind of treasures and resources as you move in here, and as you do different actions, you need those resources in order to dig those tunnels. The tunnels can sort of consist of different materials, and the, the rarer material it is, the more points you're going to get for building that tunnel. And you're trying to also connect your tunnels all the way into the middle, because that's where you get the most score when you place those statues. And you need a little couch to move those statues around. There's a lot of fun stuff with this game. I think the most fun or the most interesting mechanism of the game is that to generate resources, you're recruiting more trolls into your troll mound, I think it's called, like your little group of trolls. And you do that by sort of taking a card, which, you know, you have to bribe. If you want to go for a high level, you have to bribe the ones at the low level because they will, you know, get angry. Why didn't you pick them? So they need some money to be happy. And then you can uh, recruit one of those higher level ones, which will give you more resources. Then you take this card, the troll card, and you place it into your little pyramid of cards. Let's see if I can just find that. This is my um, my uh, gameplay run through I did with Draco here. So I can also recommend you to go check it out, of course, if you think this sounds interesting. So here I have my, my little uh, pyramid there of uh, trolls. And the game will end when one player has reached the top, which is, you know, you start with four cards and then you go to three and two and one. So it's not that long. It's not that long game. But when you place a new troll, it will produce the resources on that card, but also on the cards below it. 
in the pyramid that are touching. So you'll sort of cascade, which means the last troll you play, you will make a bunch of resources, but then you only have two more turns before the game is over. So you need to, you know, uh, dig and, and get those uh, statues and all that. And that, I think that is really cool. Uh, here's we have the little troll uh, market, basically, where you can get new trolls. I, I think it's really cool how they made that. Now, that is fun, but I think the main game is not that exciting for me. Uh, the whole, it's, we have these Tetris pieces that we, you know, dig into the mountain with. And I think the issue that really uh, bugs me is that it doesn't really matter which piece you get. It's not like in some, uh, you know, Tetris style games where you're trying to pick it, put them together and all that. You do that, but it didn't feel like that was so important. It felt like, I think the, the main, to sum it up, I think this game felt too easy for me. It didn't really, you know, may put me into hard decisions where I had to, you know, go grind through, okay, how am I going to do this the best way? It was more like easy going and just, you know, play and have fun and, and which is not a bad thing in some ways, but from the look of the game, how big it is, how many things are included in it and all, I would like some more meaty stuff, I think. I think I would have liked it if it was a bit more heavy, actually. I think it was a bit too lightweight for me. Uh, it's really a family style game. You can play this with anyone, really. And it's not that much to consider, you just, I don't know, it felt too easy in some ways. And I think what really made it easy for me, make it feel easy for me, is those workshops, which is a good idea. Out on the map there's certain spots where you can build a workshop. If you connect a tunnel to that spot, then you will for free build a workshop there. You can take one of the ones that are out there uh, in the display, depending on how many players you are, you have a different number of workshops to choose from. And you place that workshop and then depending on how many tunnel exits or entrances you have connecting to that workshop, you get, an, you know, if you have two, then you get to do that action twice at the start of your next turn or, or your, all your turns because you have the tunnel connected to the workshop. But those workshops were really powerful. <laughs> they were so powerful. So uh, I got, uh, no, I, both, I think I played this twice. Both times I got it like really early uh, and I got to that special ability and it, it really helped me out and you know I, for some reason I just felt like everything was going too easy and maybe again um, I play this on two and three maybe on four it would be better because it would be I don't know more crowded but then you have a bigger map as well so I don't know I, I don't know it wasn't bad it wasn't a bad impression and it wasn't a great impression it was in the middle there uh, you know, it's like a 7 out of 10 or 6.5 or something like that, which it's not bad at all. It's just not something that I will, you know, it's not my copy of the game and I won't go out uh, looking for a copy. Um, I, I, can, I can play it again if someone, you know, uh, this is Matt's copy. If he brings it up and he wants to play, yeah, sure, I can play it. It's like an hour, 45 minutes, an hour to play. And yeah, really, really, really interesting with this. I would like to see this, this pyramid building, this tableau building of trolls in a pyramid and how that generates resources. I would like to see that in some other game because I did like that mechanism. So that is in the whole of Mountain King. Okay, then we have, oh, this is this is mental blocks and I just came in in the video here where I sp speeded up the video because it got kind of boring too. Because me and Martin were trying to play this and film it. And wow, I don't know. I mean, we're stupid in some ways. So we don't, we don't think in this kind of way. It's a 3D puzzle. And we were playing like the easiest mode uh, it's really cool with these uh, pieces and you're trying to pus puzzle them together. So, because you get a card that you're not supposed to show the other players and that's how the cube or whatever you're building should look from your perspective. And then there's four perspectives, like, you know, four sides. So if you're four players, everyone has one of those cards and you have to talk to each other to cooperatively figure out how the, the cube should be built. Uh, it was really hard for us. <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't our thing, I guess. I mean, we, we tried to we tried to figure it out, and we had to, we had a hard time just understanding how the game worked or how we should be thinking in the game to in order to pull it off. So it's not my best video in any way, <laughs> but I hope you can have a bit of fun with it because if you can if you're good at this stuff, you're gonna be laughing at us as we try to figure this out. But yeah, this is not the keeper for me. I already sold it, um, and it's not because I don't think the game is good. I think the game is amazing if you like this kind of games because that you know. If you like these kind of puzzles, if you're good at thinking in three-dimensionally, like cubes and all that, and you find that fun, especially, I mean, it's not just about being good at it, it's about if you enjoy that. Uh, for me, I really don't enjoy that kind of stuff. I, I, I hate when it's like uh, it's like some, some magazines or newspapers have these mind uh, nuts or whatever it's called that you're trying to figure out. I don't generally like that kind of stuff. 
so, but if you like this kind of things, I don't even consider this, in some ways I don't consider it a game, it's more like some kind of uh, mind exercise, I don't know, uh, then, you know, go check it out. You can check out the video here as well. So, mental blocks, not for me, but probably for someone else. The guy that I, I, I sold it to, he was really excited about it. <laughs> so. All right, so next up we have something that I did like, Paladins of the West Kingdom. And um, this is my video here, my playthrough where I played together with Matt. And so we had two different cameras, so two different camera angles. I really like how that turned out in this video as well. So like right now you're watching my angle in the big screen and Matt's is so behind me here in the corner. And then I switched back and forth uh, between these as we, we kept playing, which really helped out, I think, to follow along with the game. Because a lot of this game happens on your own player board. It doesn't happen on, on a common board in the middle. And... I mean, this is like the, this is a follow up to Architects of the West Kingdom, which I didn't really like that much. I'm not going to go into that, but that wasn't really my game. But in Paladins, it's, it's really multiplayer solitaire, which I do like. There's not that much uh, interaction and competition. You, you do your own thing on your board. And I really like how these worker placement on your board is, reminds me of Orleans, which is a game that I like as well. But there you draw from a bag, but here instead you sort of get workers from drafting cards and so on at the start of each round and you get workers from different actions and so on. But you place them out in the same way like you do in Orleans. So a spot might need, as you can see here, it might need a, a black, uh, a blue and whatever worker in order to do a certain action. So you place them out there, you do the action and you're, you're building up like an engine that gets better and better as you go. And you have different focus areas that you can focus on some of them um, you know you there's some they have there's some synergies between if you want to be fighting and building garrisons or fortify or whatever uh, really enjoy that and I really like the base mechanisms here as well because at the start of your turn you have this deck of cards and everyone has the same cards in those decks but you draw three you pick one to play during this this round which will give you a special effect and all that and also determine some of those uh, workers you will have access to. And then you take the other two cards, one you put at the bottom of your deck, which will come up later, and one you put at the top, and then you will have that as an option in your next round. So really interesting stuff there. Uh, re yeah, there's a lot of good things going on in this game. I think also the the theme really comes out, like it's Euro game with all this multiplayer solitaire and all that, but there is a real theme in it. Uh, you're really building up these paladins, you're really building up your kingdom, doing different actions to score points, but also to become better at, you know, so building your engine. And there's a lot of, although there we have some autofocus problems there, but there's a lot of fun stuff going on in this uh, live playthrough that we did as well. So I can rec recommend you to check that out. It was fairly long, but we had a really good time playing. We did some mistakes with rules and so on, I think. There was a few mistakes there that we I, I've noted in, in the Klingon subtitles as well. But it, we had a good time and I, I really want to play this again. I'm not really sure if, if the, it just makes... It doesn't really make any sense to play with this with three or four players uh, because it was just as good at, at two players, I think. Um, I, I think you can play solo as well. We'd like to try that. Yeah, so Paladins of the West Kingdom. I can really recommend this one. Okay, next up we have... Well, it's Pirates, as I call it. It's called Pirates. In, in big uh, letters on the front of the box, but on Board Game Geek, it's, you know, the actual name of the game is Extraordinary Adventures Pirates. I think there's a series of these games with Extraordinary Adventures. So maybe it should have been in the E slot, but I put it in the P slot anyway. So, so this is a, a game from Forbidden Games and designed by uh, Don Bayer and Glenn Drover. Uh, Glenn Drover did some really cool games earlier as well, I know. Uh, this one has, first of all, this was a surprise for me from Essence Spiel because Martin picked it up, picked it up. He talk, was talking to Forbidden Games. And um, so I didn't have this on my to check out list. I'm not really sure why, but maybe, I, I don't know. There were so many games before Essence Spiel. Anyway, the map looks amazing, I think. I really like this artwork on the map. And it, it's exactly the same map as in Maracaibo, <laughs> which is pretty fun. Um, but it's, it, it doesn't have anything else to do with Maracaibo. But it's the same map, but it looks better than it does in Maracaibo, in my opinion. Anyway, the game is a sort of family-style game where you sail your little ships. Well, I have the plastic ships. I don't know. Um, you sail, sail them around. This, this is a racing game. There's three different tracks you race on, which is interesting. So 
it's a deck builder as well. So you build your deck of cards and then you play every time, every time it's your turn, you have five cards in hand, but you only get to play three of them. So you keep two for the next round, which is interesting as well. And then you draw back up to your five hand sites at the end of your turn. So you're trying to sail all these three tracks. And like when I play a card that has a three on it, I can I can go three spaces on with one of my ships on one of those tracks. And then I can play two more cards. I don't need to go with the same track for all those three cards. Because there's a race, the game will end when someone gets to the uh, Trinidad Tobago, I think, uh, down in the right corner. But also, then we will score points depending on how, you know, if, if we're in the lead on which position we have in each of those tracks. I played this on two players and on four players, and I think it was a lot better on four, um, which makes sense. It's a racing game, most racing games, all that. And it's really, uh, I really liked it. I mean, it's really family weight, it's really lightweight. But there's some interesting decisions and interesting stuff going on because the, the the cards you start with are fairly simple. But every time you plunder a merchant ship, which you will sail and do, then you will you get some resource cubes, but you will also get to draw blindly. You get to draw a new card, which will be a bit better than the starting card. So that will go through your deck. And then when you go into a port, you can spend those resource cubes in order to pick up a contract, which will get you points, uh, but also you will get to take from a market row of three cards, you get to take a new card into your deck because you discard pile and then it comes in later on. As you run out of your deck, you shuffle it all like a deck builder. Um, and those cards have some really cool special effects. They could make you better at sailing on one of these three tracks. It could be some kind of attacking the other players. I really like that. And I, I liked how it's there's this balance between how... When will the game end? How, how far is it to go? Will someone rush to the end? Should I do it? Uh, should I try to win you know, all the tracks, which could be tough? Maybe I try to win one or two, uh, place decent in the third one. And and also this like, okay, I need to sail to go for that merchant ship because that has like two yellow resource cubes on it. I need those cubes in order to fulfill a certain contract, but I need to do that before one of my opponents fulfill that contract because then it's gone and then I'm sitting there with my cubes that I can't use really so yeah a lot of interesting stuff in this one uh, I can really recommend it especially if you're looking for like a, a fun racing game a slow deck builder uh, you don't get that many new cards into your deck but some uh, you can also thin out, thin out your deck as you go which I would also like in a deck builder so I can really recommend Extraordinary Adventures Pirates then next up we have Runestones which is a game from uh, last year from Queen Games, uh, Rudiger Dorn, designer. Uh, this is something that I was, you know, I was looking for and looking forward to, and wanted to check out. And it was okay. I, I think it was a okay, okay game, but I think it really overstayed its, its welcome, as it's called in English. I think this game was way too long uh, for what it is. Uh, I only played it once on four players, and the first part, like the first half of the game, I really had fun, and it was really interesting. And you're, what you're doing is, you either grab cards from this market row and you use those cards then you can use those cards in order to grab gems uh, and stone uh, rune stones out here and or gems and then you use those gems in order to buy rune stones that give you special abilities and you also score points that way um so yeah it has some really you know fairly basic it had a bit of a splendor feel to it for me or a century you know spice road uh, that kind of gather resources or gems, spend those gems to get some things that get you special abilities, but also get you points, and then you have your special abilities, and that's sort of where the game should have ended for me. But then it kept going for like like 30 more minutes, where you just kept doing the same thing over and over. And I don't know, I, I think it was too slow. Now, some of the people I played with, they have played it before, and they said that it was way quicker earlier on. I don't know why it was slow in our game. But for some reason, it just it just felt too long for me, uh, and I I kind of liked what you did in the game, but I I don't see myself playing this like ten times uh, because not really it, there's not much that changes. Uh, it's just maybe you know you can try different strategies, you can get different rune stones with different effects. But I like the components, I like the look of the game and all that, and and, and the, it was a fun gameplay for a while, but. I think I'm also a little bit burned out on these kind of games, you know, Splendor, Sentry, Spice, these like collect resources and just, you know, spend the resources in order to get points. 
there's a lot of games that do that. And uh, this needs to be something else in there. It needs to be something interesting. Uh, the choices in this game is not that complicated. It's fairly, you know, basically the game is playing. You know, you choose at the, at the first half, it's interesting because you choose those special abilities. But once you got those, then you just do your thing. Then you just boom, 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 do your thing, get the points. And hope that you get to the end of the track faster than anyone else. Because it's a race. Whoever gets first to the end of the track of points is the winner. So it's not a bad game at all. But I don't think it's something I will be searching out in the future to play more. And, and yeah, that, there's, there's a lot of games that do similar things. So that's how it goes. Now let's go to the last one. And the last game for today, for this vlog. Uh, maybe you skipped all the way out here, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, The Taverns of Thief and Tall. This is from Wolfgang Warsh, who did, you know, Quacks of Kredlinburg and Gunshin Clever uh, the year before, you know, 2018. And this was his, one of his 2019 games. It was a big hit. I think a lot of people liked this a lot. Uh, it has some really interesting stuff. I don't even know how to start explaining it. Um, John Gets Games has made a really good uh, playthrough of this. I can recommend you go check that out if, uh, if you want to see how the game plays. But you'll do that after you've been hearing my uh, ramble here about the game. You have your little own tavern in, in Thief and Hall, wherever that is in Germany, I guess. And it's like a medieval tavern. And every round, you go, you have, you're going to draw a card from your deck. And you're, you, it's like a deck builder, so you're going to build that deck up as you go. And then you're going to place them out on your board. And you have a certain amount of tables. And when you draw a few guests, they will fill up those tables. And when all those tables are full, then you don't get to draw any more cards. So you're hoping to draw other cards that doesn't fill your table, like a waitress or a dishwasher or a beer delivery guy or an entertainer. Because they will all give you different kinds of uh, either beer or money. And you use that money to upgrade your tavern. It's really cool. I really like how they made this. So you can actually flip stuff in your cardboard stuff in your little tavern to make them better uh, and you also get beer which lets you recruit more you know, uh, you know learn more guests into your tavern which is you know getting new cards into your deck uh, better guests and then every time uh, every round you draw dice you roll dice and then you draw from these little uh, uh, thingies whatever it's called in english that you have your beer on and you pass them around and so you keep draw drafting these dice and you need a certain am amount of pips on the die to serve a certain guest. So uh, one of the guests might have uh, only only wants a five, but that gives you five money. So that, then it's important for you to get a five. Uh, maybe you don't have any use of that at all for a three. There's some spaces that you can place any pip value on, but it is restricted. So you're trying to get the, the, the drafting going for you to match whatever cards you got that round because that's sort of a bit random. Now you choose what you place in your deck, but then whatever comes up that round and how many cards you get out for that round is, is gonna vary. But there's a lot of fun stuff in this game. I really, really enjoyed it. I think it's, it's an amazing, uh, cute and fun and thematic experience. And it's, it's really it's really enjoyable. I really wanna play it again. Uh, because I, you know, I tried some strategies. Now I wanna try another strategy, I only played it once. So uh, Tavern of Thief and Tall has some really good stuff going for it. And I think, I think most people will enjoy this. It's, it's some kind of, I mean, it's dick building, it's dice draw thing. That's two of my favorite mechanisms of all time. Uh, it has nice components with these cardboard uh, little thingies that you can flip over and modify your tavern. So after a while, my tavern will look different than yours. I just love it. Uh, <laughs> so much fun stuff going on in Taverns of Thief and Tall. And that was the first impressions vlog the first first impressions vlog that i ever made i made some you know, similar things earlier on but then i just talked about games that i filmed this is about games that i played i think that's more interesting as a topic and it's been fun doing this uh, fairly long <laughs> obviously uh, but i hope that you have had a you know if you didn't watch it all i hope you could use that feature of just jumping forward and you know we have a little text up there in the top right corner so you can see what comes next in, and it's all in alphabetical order as well and I'll be back in a month or so um, with, you know, what I played during February and probably won't be 13 games. I don't know. Maybe I'll play a bunch of new games in February as well. Uh, it's really fun. I love playing new games. Trying new games is, is what I like to do. So, so yeah, it fits this f format well. And this is the closest I will get, I think, to making reviews of games um, because here I can talk freely about the games, pros and cons but I don't rate them really, which I shouldn't do because it's just a first impression. Some games need more than one, one or two plays in order to really shine. 
So, you know, take whatever I say with a grain of salt, because you might have played the game 10 times and you really found some stuff in there that I haven't seen yet. And that's why you like it a lot. And tell me in the comment section if that's the case or if you agree with me or not. It's always fun to have a discussion down there in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like the video if you did like it. And, you know, subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great evening or morning whenever you're watching. Take care. Bye-bye. Breathe in. Look into these eyes. Subscribe to the channel. Now, exhale.